Buddhistic India, delivered at the Shakespeare Club, Pasadena, California, on February 2, 1900. Buddhistic India is our subject tonight. Almost all of you perhaps have read Edwin Arnold's poem on the life of Buddha, and some of you perhaps have gone into the subject with more scholarly interest, as in English, French and German, there is quite a lot of Buddhistic literature. Buddhism itself is the most interesting of subjects, for it is the first historical outburst of a world religion. There have been great religions before Buddhism arose, in India and elsewhere, but more or less they are confined within their own races. The ancient Hindus or ancient Jews or ancient Persians, every one of them had a great religion, but these religions were more or less racial. With Buddhism first begins that peculiar phenomenon of religion boldly starting out to conquer the world. Apart from its doctrines and the truths it taught and the message it had to give, we stand face to face with one of the tremendous cataclysms of the world. Within a few centuries of its birth, the barefooted, shaven-headed missionaries of Buddha had spread over all the then-known civilized world and they penetrated even further, from Lapland on the one side to the Philippine Islands on the other. They had spread widely within a few centuries of Buddha's birth, and in India itself, the religion of Buddha had at one time nearly swallowed up two-thirds of the population. The whole of India was never Buddhistic. It stood outside. Buddhism had the same fate as Christianity had with the Jews. The majority of the Jews stood aloof. So the old Indian religion lived on. But the comparison stops here. Christianity, though it could not get within its fold all the Jewish race, itself took the country. Where the old religion existed, the religion of the Jews that was conquered by Christianity in a very short time and the old religion was dispersed and so the religion of the Jews lives a sporadic life in different parts of the world. But in India, this gigantic child was absorbed in the long run by the mother that gave it birth and today the very name of Buddha is almost unknown all over India. You know more about Buddhism than 99% of the Indians. At best, they of India only know the name. Oh, he was a great prophet, a great incarnation of God, and there it ends. The island of Ceylon remains to Buddha, and in some parts of the Himalayan country, there are some Buddhists yet. Beyond that, there are none, but Buddhism has spread over all the rest of Asia. Still, it has the largest number of followers of any religion, and it has indirectly modified the teachings of all the other religions. A good deal of Buddhism entered into Asia Minor, it was a constant fight at one time whether the Buddhists would prevail or the later sects of Christians. The Gnostics and other sects of early Christians were more or less Buddhistic in their tendencies and all these got fused up in that wonderful city of Alexandria and out of the fusion under Roman law came Christianity. Buddhism in its political and social aspect is even more interesting than its doctrines and dogmas and as the first outburst of the tremendous world-conquering power of religion, it is very interesting also. I am mostly interested in this lecture in India as it has been affected by Buddhism. And to understand Buddhism and its rise a bit, we have to get a few ideas about India as it existed when this great prophet was born. There was already in India a vast religion with an organized scripture, the Vedas. And these Vedas existed as a mass of literature and not a book. Just as you find the Old Testament, the Bible. Now the Bible is a mass of literature of different ages different persons are the writers, and so on. It is a collection. Now the Vedas are a vast collection. I do not know whether if the texts were all found. Nobody has found all the texts. Nobody even in India has seen all the books. If all the books were known, this room would contain them. It is a huge mass of literature carried down from generation to generation from God who gave the scriptures. And the idea about the scriptures in India became tremendously orthodox. You complain of your orthodoxies in book worship. If you get the Hindu's idea, where will you be? The Hindus think the Vedas are the direct knowledge of God, that God has created the whole universe in and through the Vedas, and that the whole universe exists because it is in the Vedas. The cow exists outside because the word cow is in the Vedas. Man exists outside because of the word in the Vedas. Here you see the beginning of that theory which later on Christians developed and expressed in the text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It is the old ancient theory of India. Upon that is based the whole idea of the scriptures. And mind, every word is the power of God. The Word is only the external manifestation on the material plane. So, 
All this manifestation is just the manifestation on the material plane. And the word is the Vedas. And Sanskrit is the language of God. God spoke once. He spoke in Sanskrit and that is the divine language. Every other language they consider is no more than the brain of animals. And to denote that they call every other nation that does not speak Sanskrit, Mlechas, the same word as the barbarians of the Greeks. They are brain, not talking, and Sanskrit is the divine language. Now the Vedas were not written by anybody. They were eternally coexistent with God. God is infinite. So is knowledge. And through this knowledge is created the world. Their idea of ethics is that a thing is good because the law says so. Everything is bounded by that book. Nothing can go beyond that. Because the knowledge of God, you cannot get beyond that. That is Indian orthodoxy. In the latter part of the Vedas, you see the highest, the spiritual. In the early portions, there is the crude part. You quote a passage from the Vedas. That is not good, you say. Why? There is a positive evil injunction. The same as you see in the Old Testament. There are a number of things in all old books, curious ideas, which we would not like in our present day. You say, this doctrine is not at all good. Why, it shocks my ethics. How did you get your idea? Merely by your own thought? Get out. If it is ordained by God, what right have you to question? When the Vedas say, do not do this, this is immoral, and so on, no more have you the right to question at all. And that is the difficulty. If you tell a Hindu, but our Bible does not say so, he will reply, Oh, your Bible, it is a babe of history. What other Bible could there be except the Vedas? What other book could there be? All knowledge is in God. Do you mean to say that he teaches by two or more Bibles? His knowledge came out in the Vedas. Do you mean to say that he committed a mistake then? Afterwards, he wanted to do something better and taught another Bible to another nation. You cannot bring another book that is as old as Vedas. Everything else, it was all copied after that. They would not listen to you. And the Christian brings the Bible. They say, that is fraud. God only spoke once because he never makes mistakes. Now just think of that. That orthodoxy is terrible. And if you ask a Hindu that he is to reform his society and do this and that, he says, is it in the books? If it is not, I do not care to change. You wait. In 500 years more, you will find this is good. If you say to him, this social institution that you have is not right, he says. How do you know that? Then he says, our social institutions in this matter are the better. Wait 500 years and your institutions will die. The test is the survival of the fittest. You live, but there is not one community in the world which lives 500 years together. Look here, we have been standing all the time. That is what they would say. Terrible orthodoxy. And thank God I have crossed that ocean. This was the orthodoxy of India. What else was there? Everything was divided, the whole society, as it is today, though in a much more rigorous form then, divided into castes. There is another thing to learn. There is a tendency to make castes just now going on here in the West. And I myself, I am a renegade. I have broken everything. I do not believe in caste individually. It has very good things in it. For myself, Lord help me. I would not have any caste if he helps me. You understand what I mean by caste and you are all trying to make it very fast. It is a hereditary trait for the Hindu. The Hindu said in olden times that life must be made easier and smoother. And what makes everything alive? Competition. Hereditary trait kills. You are a carpenter? Very good. Your son can be only a carpenter. What are you? A blacksmith? Blacksmithing becomes a caste. Your children will become blacksmiths. We do not allow anybody else to come into that trade. So you will be quiet and remain there. You are a military man, a fighter, make a caste. You are a priest, make a caste. The priesthood is hereditary and so on. Rigid, high power. That has a great side and that side is that it really rejects competition. It is that which has made the nation live while other nations have died, that caste. But there is a great evil. It checks individuality. I will have to be a carpenter because I am born a carpenter. But I do not like it. That is in the books and that was before Buddha was born. I am talking to you of India as it was before Buddha. And you are trying today what you call socialism. Good things will come, but in the long run you will be a blight upon the race. Freedom is the watchword. Be free. A free body, a free mind and a free soul. That is what I have felt all my life.
I would rather be doing evil freely than be doing good under bondage. Well, these things that they are crying for now in the West, they have done ages before there. Land has been nationalized by thousands all these things. There is blame upon this hidebound caste. The Indian people are intensely socialistic, but beyond that there is a wealth of individualism. They are as tremendously individualistic, that is to say, after laying down all these minute regulations, they have regulated how you should eat, drink, sleep, die. Everything is regulated there. From early morning to when you go to bed and sleep, you are following regulations and law. 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 Do you wonder that a nation should live under that? Law is death. The more of the law in a country, the worse for the country. But to be an individual, we go to the mountains, where there is no law, no government. The more of law you make, the more of police and socialism, the more of blackguards there are. Now this tremendous regulation of law is there. As soon as a child is born, he knows that he is born a slave. Slave to his caste first, slave to his nation next, slave, slave, slave. Every action, his drinking and his eating, he must eat under a regular method. This prayer with the first morsel, this prayer with the second, that prayer with the third, and that prayer when he drinks water. Just think of that. Thus, from day to day, it goes on and on. But they were thinkers. They knew that this would not lead to real greatness. So they left a way out for them all. After all, they found out that all these regulations are only for the world and the life of the world. As soon as you do not want money and you do not want children, no business for this world, you can go out entirely free. Those that go out thus were called sannyasins, people who have given up. They never organize themselves, nor do they now. They are a free order of men and women who refuse to marry, who refuse to possess property, and they have no law, not even the Vedas bind them. They stand on the top of the Vedas. They are at the other pole from our social institutions. They are beyond caste. They have grown beyond. They are too big to be bound by these little regulations and things. Only two things are necessary for them. They must not possess property and must not marry. If you marry, settle down or possess property, immediately the regulations will be upon you. But if you do not do either of these two, you are free. They were the living gods of the race, and 99% of our great men and women were to be found among them. In every country, real greatness of the soul means extraordinary individuality, and that individuality you cannot get in society. It frets and fumes and wants to burst society. If society wants to keep it down, that soul wants to burst society into pieces. And they made an easy channel. They say, well, once you get out of society, then you may preach and teach everything that you like. We only worship you from a distance. So there were the tremendous individualistic men and women and they are the highest persons in all society. If one of those yellow-clad shaven heads comes, the prince even dare not remain seated in his presence. He must stand. The next half hour, one of these sannyasins might be at the door of one of the cottages of the poorest subjects, glad to get only a piece of bread. And he has to mix with all grades. Now he sleeps with a poor man in his cottage. Tomorrow he sleeps on the beautiful bed of a king. One day he dines on gold plates in king's palaces. The next day he has not any food and sleeps under a tree. Society looks upon these men with great respect. And some of them, just to show their individuality, will try to shock the public ideas. But the people are never shocked so long as they keep to these principles. Perfect purity and no property. These men being very individualistic, they are always trying new theories and plans, visiting in every country. They must think something new. They cannot run in the old groove. Others are all trying to make us run in the old groove, forcing us all to think alike. But human nature is greater than any human foolishness. Our greatness is greater than our weakness. The good things are stronger than the evil things. Supposing they succeed in making us all think in the same groove, there we would be. No more thought to think. We would die. Here was a society which had almost no vitality, its members pressed down by iron chains of law. They were forced to help each other. There, one was under regulations that were tremendous, regulations even how to breathe, how to wash face and hands, how to bathe, how to brush the teeth, and so on, to the moment of death. And beyond these regulations was the wonderful individualism of the sannyasin. There he was. And every day's new sect was rising amongst these strong individualistic men and women. 
the ancient Sanskrit books tell about their standing out of one woman who was very quaint, queer old woman of the ancient times. She always had some new thing. Sometimes she was criticized, but always people were afraid of her, obeying her quietly. So there were those great men and women of old times. And within this society, so oppressed by regulations, the power was in the hands of the priests. In the social scale, the highest caste is that of the priest. And that being a business, I do not know any other word. That is why I use the word priest. It is not in the same sense as in this country, because our priest is not a man that teaches religion or philosophy. The business of a priest is to perform all these minute details of regulations which have been laid down. The priest is the man who helps in these regulations. He marries you. To your funeral, he comes to pray. So at all the ceremonies performed upon a man or a woman, the priest must be there. In society, the ideal is marriage. Everyone must marry. It is the rule. Without marriage, man is not able to perform any religious ceremony. He is only half a man. He is not competent to officiate. Even the priest himself cannot officiate as a priest, except he marries. Half a man is unfit within society. Now the power of the priests increased tremendously. The general policy of our national lawgivers was to give the priests this honour. They also had the same socialistic plan you are just ready to try that checked them from getting money. What was the motive? Social honour. Mind you, the priest in all countries is the highest in the social scale. So much so in India that the poorest Brahmin is greater than the greatest king in the country, by birth. He is the nobleman in India. But the law does not allow him ever to become rich. The law grinds him down to poverty. Only it gives him this honour. He cannot do a thousand things. And the higher is the caste in the social scale, the more restricted are its enjoyments. The higher the caste, the less the number of kinds of food that man can eat, the less the amount of food that man may eat, the less the number of occupations he may engage in. To you, his life would be only a perpetual train of hardships, nothing more than that. It is a perpetual discipline in eating, drinking and everything, and all penalties which are required from the lower caste are required from the higher ten times more. The lowest man tells a lie. His fine is one dollar. A Brahmin, he must pay, say, a hundred dollars, for he knows better. But this was a grand organization to start with. Later on, the time came when they, these priests, began to get all the power in their hands, and at last they forgot the secret of their power, poverty. They were men whom society fed and clad so that they might simply learn and teach and think. Instead of that, they began to spread out their hands to clutch at the riches of society. They became money grabbers, to use your word, and forgot all these things. Then there was the second caste, the kingly caste, the military. Actual power was in their hands. Not only so, they have produced all of our great thinkers and not the Brahmins. It is curious, all our great prophets, almost without one exception, belong to the kingly caste. The great man Krishna was also of that caste. Rama, he also, and all our great philosophers, almost all sat on the throne. Thence came all the great philosophers of renunciation. From the throne came the voice that always cried, Renounce. These military people were their kings, and they also were the philosophers. They were the speakers in the Upanishads. In their brains and their thought, they were greater than the priests. They were more powerful. They were the kings, and yet the priests got all the power and tried to tyrannize over them. And so that was going on political competition between the two castes, the priests and the kings. Another phenomenon is there. Those of you that have been to hear the first lecture already know that in India there are two great races. One is called the Aryan, the other the non-Aryan. It is the Aryan race that has the three castes, but the whole of the rest are dubbed with one name, Shudras, no caste. They are not Aryans at all. Many people came from outside of India and they found the Shudras there the aborigines of the country. However it may be, these vast masses of non-Aryan people and the mixed people among them, they gradually became civilized and they began to scheme for the same rights as the Aryans. They wanted to enter their schools and their colleges. They wanted to take the sacred thread of the Aryans. They wanted to perform the same ceremonies as the Aryans and wanted to have equal rights in religion and politics like the Aryans. And the Brahmin priest, he was the great antagonist of such claims. You see, it is the nature of priests in every country. They are the most conservative people, naturally. So long as it is a trade, it must be. It is to their interest to be conservative. 
to this tide of murmur outside the Aryan Pale, the priests were trying to check with all their might. Within the Aryan Pale, there was also a tremendous religious ferment, and it was mostly led by this military caste. There was already the sect of Jains, who are a conservative force in India even today. It is a very ancient sect. They declared against the validity of the scriptures of the Hindus, the Vedas. They wrote some book themselves, and they said, Our books are the only original books, the only original Vedas, and the Vedas that now are going on under that name have been written by the Brahmins to dupe the people. And they also laid the same plan. You see, it is difficult for you to meet the arguments of the Hindus about the scriptures. They also claim that the world has been created through those books, and they were written in the popular language. The Sanskrit, even then, had ceased to be a spoken language. It had just the same relation to the spoken language as Latin has to modern Italian. Now they wrote all their books in Pali. And when a Brahmin said, Why, your books are in Pali? They said, Sanskrit is a language of the dead. In their methods and manners they were different. For you see, these Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, are a vast mass of accumulation. Some of them crude, until you come to where religion is taught. Only the spiritual. Now that was the portion of the Vedas which these sects all claimed to preach. Then there are three steps in the ancient Vedas. First, work. Second, worship. Third, knowledge. When a man purifies himself by work and worship, then God is within that man. He has realized he is already there. He only can have seen him because the mind has become pure. Now the mind can become purified by work and worship. That is all. Salvation is already there. We don't know it. Therefore, work, worship and knowledge are the three steps. By work, they mean doing good to others. That has of course something in it, but mostly, as to the Brahmins, work means to perform these elaborate ceremonials. Killing of cows and killing of bulls, killing of goats and all sorts of animals that are taken fresh and thrown into the fire and so on. Now, declared the Jains, that is no work at all because injuring others can never be any good work. And they said, This is the proof that your Vedas are false Vedas, manufactured by the priests, because you do not mean to say that any good book will order us to be killing animals and doing these things. You do not believe it. So all this killing of animals and other things that you see in the Vedas, they have been written by the Brahmins, because they alone are benefited. It is the priest only who pockets the money and goes home. So therefore it is all priestcraft. It was one of their doctrines that there cannot be any god. The priests have invented God, that the people may believe in God and pay them money. All nonsense. There is no God. There is nature and there are souls, and that is all. Souls have got entangled into this life and got round them the clothing of man you call a body. Now, do good work. But from that naturally came the doctrine that everything that is matter is vile. They are the first teachers of asceticism. If the body is the result of impurity, why, therefore, the body is vile. If a man stands on one leg for some time, all right, it is a punishment. If the head comes up bump against a wall, rejoice, it is a very good punishment. Some of the great founders of the Franciscan order, one of them St. Francis, were going to a certain place to meet somebody. And St. Francis had one of his companions with him, and he began to talk as to whether the person would receive them or not. And this man suggested that possibly he would reject them. Said St. Francis, that is not enough, brother. But if when we go and knock at the door, the man comes and drives us away, that is not enough. But if he orders us to be bound and gives us a thorough whipping, even that is not enough. And then, if he binds us hand and foot and whips us until we bleed at every pore and throws us outside in the snow, that would be enough. These same ascetic ideas prevailed at that time. These gens were the first great ascetics, but they did some great work. Don't injure any and do good to all that you can. And that is all the morality and ethics. And that is all the work there is. And the rest is all nonsense. The Brahmins created that. Throw it all away. And then they went to work and elaborated this one principle all through. And it is the most wonderful ideal. How all that we call ethics, they simply bring out from that one great principle of non-injury and doing good. This sect was at least 500 years before Buddha and he was 550 years before Christ. Now the whole of the animal creation they divide into five sections. The lowest have only one organ, that of touch. The next one, touch and taste. The next, touch, taste and hearing. The next, 
touch, taste, hearing and sight. And the next, the five organs. The first two, the one organ and the two organ are invisible to the naked eye and they are everywhere in water. A terrible thing, killing these low forms of life. This bacteriology has come into existence in the modern world only in the last 20 years and therefore nobody knew anything about it. They said the lowest animals are only one organ, touch, nothing else. The next greater were also invisible and they all knew that if you boiled water, these animals were all killed. So these monks, if they died of thirst, they would never kill these animals by drinking water. But if a monk stands at your door and you give him a little boiled water, the sin is on you of killing the animals and he will get the benefit. They carry these ideas to ludicrous extremes. For instance, in rubbing the body, if he bathes, he will have to kill numbers of animalcules. So he never bathes. He gets killed himself. He says that is all right. Life has no care for him. He will get killed and save life. These Jains were there. There were various other sects of ascetics. And while this was going on, on the one hand, there was the political jealousy between the priests and the kings. And then these different dissatisfied sects were springing up everywhere. And there was the greater problem. The vast multitudes of people wanting the same rights as the Aryans, dying of thirst while the perennial stream of nature went flowing by them, and no right to drink a drop of water. And that man was born, the great man Buddha. Most of you know about him, his life. And in spite of all the miracles and stories that generally get fastened upon any great man, in the first place, he is one of the most historical prophets of the world. Two are very historical. One, the most ancient Buddha, and the other, Muhammad, because both friends and foes are agreed about them. So we are perfectly sure that there were such persons. As for the other persons, we have only to take for granted what the disciples say, nothing more. Our Krishna, you know, the Hindu prophet, he is very mythological. A good deal of his life and everything about him is written only by his disciples. And then there seem to be sometimes three or four men who all loom into one. We do not know so clearly about many of the prophets, but as to this man, because both friends and foes write of him, we are sure that there was such a historical personage. And if we analyze through all the fables and reports of miracles and stories that generally are heaped upon a great man in this world, we will find an inside core. And all through the account of that man, he never did a thing for himself. Never. How do you know that? Because you see, when fables are fastened upon a man, the fables must be tinged with that man's general character. Not one fable tried to impute any vice or any immorality to the man. Even his enemies have favourable accounts. When Buddha was born, he was so pure that whosoever looked at his face from a distance immediately gave up the ceremonial religion and became a monk and became saved. So the gods held a meeting. They said, we are undone because most of the gods live upon the ceremonials. These sacrifices go to the gods and these sacrifices were all gone. The gods were dying of hunger and the reason for it was that their power was gone. So the gods said, we must anyhow put this man down. He is too pure for our life. And then the gods came and said, Sir, we come to ask you something. We want to make a great sacrifice and we mean to make a huge fire. And we have been seeking all over the world for a pure spot to light the fire on and could not find it. And now we have found it. If you will lie down on your breast, we will make the huge fire. Granted, he says, go on. And the gods built the fire high upon the breast of Buddha and they thought he was dead and he was not. And then they went about and said, we are undone. And all the gods began to strike him. No good. They could not kill him. From underneath, the voice comes. Why are you making all these vain attempts? Whoever looks upon you becomes purified and is saved and nobody is going to worship us. Then your attempt is vain, because purity can never be killed. This fable was written by his enemies, and yet throughout the fable, the only blame that attaches to Buddha is that he was so great a teacher of purity. About his doctrines, some of you know a little. It is his doctrines that appeal to many modern thinkers whom you call agnostics. He was a great preacher of the brotherhood of mankind. Aryan or non-Aryan, caste or no caste, and sects or no sects. Everyone has the same right to God and to religion and to freedom. Come in all of you. But as to other things, he was very agnostic. Be practical. There came to him one day five young men, Brahmin born, quarrelling upon a question. 
they came to him to ask him the way to truth. And one said, My people teach this, and this is the way to truth. The other said, I have been taught this, and this is the only way to truth. Which is the right way, sir? Well, you say your people taught this is truth, and is the way to God? Yes. But did you see God? No, sir. Your father? No, sir. Your grandfather? No, sir. None of them saw God? No. Well, and your teachers? Neither any of them saw God? No. And he asked the same to the others. They all declared that none had seen God. Well, said Buddha, in a certain village came a young man weeping and howling and crying. Oh, I love her so. Oh my, I love her so. And then the villagers came, and the only thing he said was he loved her so. Who is she that you love? I do not know. Where does she live? I do not know. But he loved her so. How does she look? That I do not know. But oh, I love her so. Then asked Buddha, Young man, what would you call this young man? Why, sir, he was a fool. And they all declared, Why, sir, that young man was certainly a fool, to be crying and all that about a woman, to say he loved her so much and he never saw her or knew that she existed or anything? Are you not the same? You say that this God your father or your grandfather never saw, and now you are quarrelling upon a thing which neither you nor your ancestors ever knew, and you are trying to cut each other's throats about it. Then the young man asked, What are we to do? Now tell me, did your father ever teach that God is ever angry? No, sir. Did your father ever teach that God is evil? No, sir. He is always pure. Well, now if you are pure and good and all that, do you not think that you will have more chance to come near to that God than by discussing all this and trying to cut each other's throats? Therefore, say I, be pure and be good. Be pure and love everyone. And that was all. You see that non-killing of animals and charity towards animals was an already existing doctrine when he was born, but it was new with him, the breaking down of caste, that tremendous movement. And the other thing that was new, he took forty of his disciples and sent them all over the world, saying, Go ye, mix with all races and nations, and preach the excellent gospel for the good of all, for the benefit of all. And of course he was not molested by the Hindus. He died at a ripe old age. All his life he was a most stern man. He never yielded to weakness. I do not believe many of his doctrines, of course. I do not. I believe that the Vedantism of the old Hindus is much more thoughtful, is a grander philosophy of life. I like his method of work, but what I like most in that man is that, among all the prophets of mankind, here was a man who never had any cobwebs in his brain, and who was sane and strong. When kingdoms were at his feet, he was still the same man, maintaining, I am a man amongst men. Why, the Hindus, they are dying to worship somebody. You will find, if you live long enough, I will be worshipped by a people. If you go there to teach them something, before you die, you will be worshipped, always trying to worship somebody. And living in that race, the world-honoured Buddha, he died always declaring that he was but man. None of his adulators could draw from him one remark that he was anything different from any other man. Those last dying words of his always thrilled through my heart. He was old, he was suffering, he was near his death, and then came the despised outcast. He lives on carrion, dead animals. The Hindus would not allow them to come into cities. One of these invited him to a dinner and he came with his disciples, and the poor Chanda, he wanted to treat this great teacher according to what he thought would be best. So he had a lot of pig's flesh and a lot of rice for him. And Buddha looked at that. The disciples were all hesitating and the master said, Well, do not eat, you will be hurt. But he quietly sat down and ate. The teacher of equality must eat the outcast Chanda's dinner, even the pig's flesh. He sat down and ate it. He was already dying. He found death coming on and he asked, Spread for me something under this tree, for I think the end is near. And he was there under the tree, and he laid himself down. He could not sit up any more. And the first thing he did, he said, Go to that Chanda and tell him that he has been one of my greatest benefactors. For his meal, I am going to Nirvana. And then several men came to be instructed, and a disciple said, Do not go near now, the master is passing away. And as soon as he heard it, the Lord said, Let them come in. And somebody else came, and the disciples would not let them enter. Again they came, and then the dying Lord said, And oh, thou Ananda, I am passing away. Weep not for me, 
think not for me i am gone work out diligently your own salvation each one of you is just what i am i am nothing but one of you what i am today is what i made myself do your struggle and make yourselves what i am these are the memorable words of buddha believe not because an old book is produced as an authority believe not because your father said you should believe the same believe not because other people like you believe it test everything try everything and then believe it and if you find it for the good of many give it to all and with these words the master passed away see the sanity of the man no gods no angels no demons nobody nothing of the kind stern sane every brain cell perfect and complete even at the moment of death no delusion i do not agree with many of his doctrines you may not but in my opinion oh if i had only one drop of that strength the sanest philosopher the world ever saw its best and its sanest teacher and never that man bent before even the power of the tyrannical brahmins never that man bent direct and everywhere the same weeping with the miserable helping the miserable singing with the singing strong with the strong and everywhere the same sane and able man and of course with all this i cannot understand his doctrine you know he denied that there was any soul in man that is in the hindu sense of the word now we hindus all believe that there is something permanent in man which is unchangeable and which is living through all eternity and that in man we call atman which is without beginning and without end and we believe that there is something permanent in nature and that we call brahman which is also without beginning and without end he denied both of these he said there is no proof of anything permanent it is all a mere mass of change a mass of thought in a continuous change is what you call a mind the torch is leading the procession the circle is a delusion or take the example of a river it is a continuous river passing on every moment a fresh mass of water passing on so is this life so is all body so is all mind well i do not understand his doctrine we hindus never understood it but i can understand the motive behind that oh the gigantic motive the master says that selfishness is the great curse of the world that we are selfish and that herein is the curse there should be no motive for selfishness you are like a river passing on a continuous phenomenon have no god have no soul stand on your feet and do good for good sake neither for fear of punishment nor for the sake of going anywhere stand sane and motiveless the motive is i want to do good it is good to do good tremendous tremendous i do not sympathize with his metaphysics at all but my mind is jealous when i think of the moral force just ask your minds which one of you can stand for one hour able and daring like that man i cannot for 5 minutes i would become a coward and want a support i am weak a coward and i warm to think of this tremendous giant we cannot approach that strength the world never saw anything compared to that strength and i have not yet seen any other strength like that we are all born cowards if we can save ourselves we care about nothing else inside is the tremendous fear the tremendous motive all the time our own selfishness makes us the most arrogant cowards our own selfishness is the great cause of fear and cowardice and there he stood do good because it is good ask no more questions that is enough a man made to do good by a fable a story a superstition he will be doing evil as soon as the opportunity comes that man alone is good who does good for good sake and that is the character of the man and what remains of man was asked of the master everything everything but what is in the man not the body not the soul but character and that is left for all ages all that have passed and died they have left for us their characters eternal possessions for the rest of humanity and these characters are working working all through what of buddha what of jesus of nazareth the world is full of their characters tremendous doctrine let us come down a little we have not come to the subject at all laughter i must add not a few words more this evening and then what he did his method of work organization the idea that you have today of church is his character he left the church he organized these monks and made them into a body even the voting by ballot is there 560 years before christ minute organization the church was left and became a tremendous power 
and did great missionary work in India and outside India. Then came 300 years after, 200 years before Christ, the great emperor Ashoka, as he has been called by our Western historians, the divinest of monarchs, and that man became entirely converted to the ideas of Buddha, and he was the greatest emperor of the world at that time. His grandfather was a contemporary of Alexander, and since Alexander's time, India had become more intimately connected with Greece. Every day in Central Asia, some inscription or other is being found. India had forgotten all about Buddha and Ashoka and everyone, but there were pillars, obelisks, columns, with ancient letters which nobody could read. Some of the old Mughal emperors declared they would give millions for anybody to read those, but nobody could. Within the last 30 years, those have been read. They are all written in Pali. The first inscription is, and then he writes this inscription, describing the terror and the misery of war, and then he became converted to religion. Then said he, Henceforth, let none of my descendants think of acquiring glory by conquering other races. If they want glory, let them help other races. Let them send teachers of sciences and teachers of religion. A glory won by the sword is no glory at all. And next you find how he is sending missionaries even to Alexandria. You wonder that you find all over that part of the country sects rising immediately, called Therapeutae, Essenes, and all those extreme vegetarians and so on. Now this great emperor Ashoka built hospitals for men and for animals. The inscriptions show they are ordering hospitals, building hospitals for men and for animals. That is to say, when an animal gets old, if I am poor and cannot keep it any longer, I do not shoot it down for mercy. These hospitals are maintained by public charity. The coasting traders pay so much upon every hundred weight they sell, and all that goes to the hospital, so nobody is touched. If you have a cow that is old, anything, and do not want to keep it, send it to the hospital. They keep it, even down to rats and mice and anything you send. Only our ladies try to kill these animals sometimes, you know. They go in large numbers to see them and they bring all sorts of cakes. The animals are killed many times by this food. He claimed that the animals should be as much under the protection of the government as man. Why should animals be allowed to be killed? There is no reason. But he says before prohibiting the killing of animals for food even, people must be provided with all sorts of vegetables. So he sent and collected all kinds of vegetables and planted them in India. And then, as soon as these were introduced, the order was, henceforth, whosoever kills an animal will be punished. A government is to be a government. The animals must be protected also. What business has a man to kill a cow, a goat or any other animal for food? Thus, Buddhism was and did become a great political power in India. Gradually, it also fell to pieces, after all, this tremendous missionary enterprise. But to their credit, it must be said, they never took up the sword to preach religion. Excepting the Buddhistic religion, there is not one religion in the world which could make one step without bloodshed, not one which could enter a hundred thousand converts just by brain power alone. No, no, all through. And this is just what you are going to do in the Philippines. That is your method. Make them religious by the sword. That is what your priests are preaching. Conquer and kill them that they may get religion. A wonderful way of preaching religion. You know how this great emperor Ashoka was converted. This great emperor in his youth was not so good. He had a brother. And the two brothers quarreled and the other brother defeated this one. And the emperor in vengeance wanted to kill him. The emperor got the news that he had taken shelter with a Buddhistic monk. Now I have told you how our monks are very holy. No one would come near them. The emperor himself came. He said, Deliver the man to me. Then the monk preached to him, Vengeance is bad. Disarm anger with love. Anger is not cured by anger, nor hatred by hatred. Dissolve anger by love. Cure hatred by love. Friend, if for one evil thou returnest another, Thou curest not the first evil, but only add one evil more to the world. The emperor said, That is all right, fool that you are. Are you ready to give your life, to give your life for that man? Ready, sir. And he came out, and the emperor drew his sword, and he said, Get ready. And just as he was going to strike, he looked at the face of the man. There was not a wink in those eyes. The emperor stopped, and he said, Tell me, monk, where did you learn this strength? Poor beggar, not to wink. And then he preached again. Go on, monk, he said. 
that is nice, he said. Accordingly, he fell under the charm of the master, Buddha's charm. There have been three things in Buddhism, the Buddha himself, his law, his church. At first it was so simple. When the master died before his death, they said, What shall we do with you? Nothing. What monuments shall we make over you? He said, Just make a little heap if you want, or just do not do anything. By and by, there arose huge temples and all the paraphernalia. The use of images was unknown before then. I say they were the first to use images. There are images of Buddha and all the saints, sitting about and praying. All this paraphernalia went on multiplying with this organization. Then these monasteries became rich. The real cause of the downfall is here. Monasticism is all very good for a few. But when you preach it in such a fashion that every man or woman who has a mind immediately gives up social life, when you find over the whole of India monasteries, some containing a hundred thousand monks, sometimes twenty thousand monks in one building, huge, gigantic buildings, these monasteries scattered all over India, and of course, centers of learning and all that, who were left to procreate progeny to continue the race, only the weaklings. All the strong and vigorous minds went out, and then came national decay by the sheer loss of vigor. I will tell you of this marvelous brotherhood. It is great, but theory and idea is one thing, and actual working is another thing. The idea is very great, practicing non-resistance and all that, but if all of us go out in the street and practice non-resistance, there would be very little left in this city. That is to say, the idea is all right. But nobody has yet found a practical solution as to how to attain it. There is something in caste, so far as it means blood. Such a thing as heredity, there is, certainly. Now try to understand. Why do you not mix your blood with the Negroes, the American Indians? Nature will not allow you. Nature does not allow you to mix your blood with them. There is the unconscious working that saves the race. That was the Aryan's caste. Mind you, I do not say that they are not equal to us. They must have the same privileges and advantages and everything. But we know that if certain races mix up, they become degraded. With all the strict caste of the Aryan and non-Aryan, that wall was thrown down to a certain extent. And hordes of these outlandish races came in with all their queer superstitions and manners and customs. Think of this. Not decency enough to wear clothes, eating carrion, etc. But behind him came his fetish his human sacrifice, his superstition, his diabolism. He kept it behind. He remained decent for a few years. After that, he brought all these things out in front. And that was degrading to the whole race. And then the blood mixed. Intermarriages took place with all sorts of unmixable races. The race fell down. But in the long run, it proved good. If you mix up with Negroes and American Indians, surely this civilization will fall down. But hundreds and hundreds years after, out of this mixture will come a gigantic race once more, stronger than ever. But for the time being, you have to suffer. The Hindus believe. That is a peculiar belief, I think. And I do not know. I have nothing to say to the contrary. I have not found anything to the contrary. They believe there was only one civilized race, the Aryan. Until he gives his blood, no other race can be civilized. No teaching will do. The Aryan gives his blood to a race and then it becomes civilized. Teaching alone will not do. He would be an example in your country. Would you give your blood to the Negro race? Then he would get higher culture. The Hindu loves caste. I may have little taint of that superstition. I do not know. I love the master's ideal. Great. But for me, I do not think that the working was very practical. And that was one of the great causes that led to the downfall of the Indian nation in the long run. But then it brought about this tremendous fusion where so many different races are all fusing, mingling. One man white like you, or yellow, while another man as black as I am, and all grades between these two extremes, and each race keeping their customs, manners, and everything. In the long run, a fusion is taking place, and out of this fusion surely will come a tremendous upheaval. But for the time being, the giant must sleep. That is the effect of all such fusion. When Buddhism went down that way, there came the inevitable reaction. There is but one entity in the whole world. It is a unit world. The diversity is only eye service. It is all one. The idea of unity and what we call monism, without duality, is the idea in India. This doctrine has been always in India. 
it was brought forward whenever materialism and skepticism broke down everything. When Buddhism broke down everything by introducing all sorts of foreign barbarians into India, their manners and customs and things, there was a reaction and that reaction was led by a young monk, Shankaracharya. And instead of preaching new doctrines and always thinking new thoughts and making sects, he brought back the Vedas to life. And modern Hinduism has thus an admixture of ancient Hinduism, over which the Vedantists predominate. But you see, what once dies never comes back to life. And those ceremonials of Hinduism never came back to life. You will be astonished if I tell you that according to the old ceremonials, he is not a good Hindu who does not eat beef. On certain occasions, he must sacrifice a bull and eat it. That is disgusting now. However, they may differ from each other in India, in that they are all one, they never eat beef. The ancient sacrifices and the ancient gods, they are all gone. Modern India belongs to the spiritual part of the Vedas. Buddhism was the first sect in India. They were the first to say, ours is the only path. Until you join our church, you cannot be saved. That was what they said. It is the correct path. But being of Hindu blood, they could not be such stony-hearted sectarians as in other countries. There will be salvation for you. Nobody will go wrong forever. No, no. There was too much of Hindu blood in them for that. The heart was not so stony as that. But you have to join them. But the Hindu idea, you know, is not to join anybody. Wherever you are, that is a point from which you can start to the centre. All right. It. Hinduism has this advantage. Its secret is that doctrines and dogmas do not mean anything. What you are is what matters. If you talk all the best philosophies the world ever produced, but if you are a fool in your behaviour, they do not count. And if in your behaviour you are good, you have more chances. This being so, the Vedantists can wait for everybody. Vedantism teaches that there is but one existence and one thing real, and that is God. It is beyond all time and space and causation and everything. We can never define him. We can never say what he is except that he is absolute existence, absolute knowledge, absolute blissfulness. He is the only reality. Of everything, he is the reality. Of you and me of the wall and of everything everywhere. It is his knowledge upon which all our knowledge depends. It is his blissfulness upon which depends our pleasure. And he is the only reality. And when man realizes this, he knows that I am the only reality because I am he. What is real in me is he also. So that when a man is perfectly pure and good and beyond all grossness, he finds, as Jesus found, I and my father are one. The Vedantist has patience to wait for everybody. Wherever you are, this is the highest. I and my father are one. Realize it. If an image helps, images are welcome. If worshipping a great man helps you, worship him. If worshipping Muhammad helps you, go on. Only be sincere. And if you are sincere, says Vedantism, you are sure to be brought to the goal. None will be left. Your heart, which contains all truth, will unfold itself chapter after chapter, till you know the last truth, that I and my Father are one. And what is salvation? To live with God. Where? Anywhere. Here, this moment. One moment in infinite time is quite as good as any other moment. This is the old doctrine of the Vedas, you see. This was revived. Buddhism died out of India. It left its mark on their charity, its animals, etc. in India and Vedantism is reconquering India from one end to the other.